I would like to thank the Leverhulm Trust uh, and the university actually for all the support in getting us to where we are today. As you'll see from my talk, this is a re really revolutionary time we are living through uh, in exoplanetary science and the next 10 years is when the big breakthroughs uh, will come, whether we like them or not, they will happen. <laughs> and we probably want to be at the forefront of that. And that's what I'm going to uh, talk about today. So we have a difficult task here, as much as it's an enormous opportunity to make those breakthroughs, it's also a big challenge to, to navigate this path. As Didier said, we are looking at very small signals. We don't even see the planet in most cases. We just see fluctuations of the starlight, and we have to tease that, uh, the information about the planet's atmospheric properties from it. And, and then to go forward and talk about life on those planets is a whole another uh, level. So how do we do it? So I'm going to propose a, a geodesic through theory and observation uh, landscape uh, to see how best we can do uh, given the resources we've got and the, and, the, and the timeline of 10 years. So exoplanet demographics, I don't need to sp spend much time here. We all know by now, thousands of planets discovered over all, uh, of all types and there are several missions that are happening right now. And will come in this decade and several ground-based efforts also happening. But basically the takeaway point is that small planets are about the most abundant out there. Right? So there are copious amounts of small planets out there. So how do we characterize them and learn about planetary habitability? So in the, in the context of what uh, we want to do uh, going forward within the context of the center and in the field in general, I like to think that we want an integrated framework that works on understanding the atmospheric and interior process in these planets. And by the end of this talk, you'll see what I mean by the word integrated. Uh, but we want to do detailed theoretical studies to understand various atmospheric interior process and the interactions between them. And then we, we want those modeling efforts to also inform our observations. We don't want to go out there without, I mean, we know that we are, that we are into uncharted territory here, but we still want some guidance from theory. And then we want to use the best facilities that we've got. We know what facilities are coming in the next 10 years. So let's make an informed decision on how to best characterize these objects, okay? So I'm going to spend uh, a little bit of time on each of these uh, topics. So first I'm uh, going into the theoretical uh, landscape. So we want to study habitable exoplanets and eventually find life on them, right? So that's, we all agree on that goal. So, if, <laughs> so if, we, if we want uh, to uh, look at planets, we want to know which planets to look at. So classically, people have defined what is known as the habitable zone that is basically motivated by conditions we have here on Earth and placing such planets around different stellar types. So this is a proxy for stellar mass or luminosity. And you'd see that as you go to cooler stars, your habitable zone where you could have liquid water on the surface of an Earth-like planet moves closer in. Okay? So that's the classical habitable zone, and there's a lot of uh, work that's happening uh, in, this, uh, in this domain. But uh, we have also uh, today discovered several planets, rocky planets, around other stars, which are in the habitable zones of their host stars, right? So we have tens of such planets, and this is a famous example I'm showing here of the Trappist-1 system, which have about four planets in the habitable zone of a small M dwarf. So, so that's all great. But is that the only criterion for habitability? Is, is having the right temperature good enough? Maybe not. If you look at all the factors that affect planetary habitability, there are various studies that are happening in the field. And this is just a compilation uh, in this uh, review paper. So you want to think about all the things that the star can do to the planet, right, over its evolutionary time scale. You also want to understand not just the planet itself, but its environment, the system, planetary system architecture. You also want to understand the orbital dynamics of the object. And of course, there are various interior processes that can contribute to, to the conditions on the planet itself, on the surface of the planet, and then various atmospheric properties and uh, surface atmosphere interactions and so on. So habitability, as you can already tell by now, is not just dependent on the equilibrium temperature, which is what the habitable zone would tell you, there are a lot of other factors that we need to take into account. And that, and so you're beginning to see what the motivation behind that integrated 
framework is. You need to take all these things in tandem. So obviously, if we want to include all of those things, it's, it's a very complicated problem. And it's, it's, uh, so, so far, we don't have such a completely integrated uh, framework to understand planetary systems, period, uh, especially habitability. But we can try to take one axis at a time and explore what limits we can place. Okay, so I'm going to, as, as a uh, case in point, I'm going to ask a very basic question. If you just take the macroscopic system parameters, the bulk, mass, radius, temperature, and so on, can we maybe expand or shrink that habitable zone slightly? What, how do you modulate that habitable zone if we go beyond just considering an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star? Right? Just Earth mass, Earth radius, and Earth temperature. If you try to tweak those and change the atmosphere and so on, can we, do anything? Can we change the habitable zone significantly? And what, what is my motivation for doing that? It, it's, uh, it's very simple, actually. So if you just look at small planets, this is called the sub-Neptune regime, planets smaller than Neptunes. And uh, we already, as I already mentioned, those planets dominate uh, the exoplanet population. And what is more, we see this bimodal distribution in radii between, in, in this regime. So in this regime, we have all the way from terrestrial, rocky-sized planets to Neptune-sized planets and everything in between. But we don't have any analogs in the solar system of that intermediate regime, right? So where do you put this cut on habitable, habitable planets if we want to start looking at exoplanets? Do we really want to stick at Earth-sized planets or do we want to go bigger? But if we go bigger, is it going to spoil the habitable uh, prospects, uh, prospects for habitability? So these are the kinds of questions that we ought to be asking right now, uh, at, at the very least. So I'll just show you an example that we tried uh, in our group over the uh, past couple of years. Uh, with this planet called K218b. So this is just like a, a thought, thought experiment, if you will. So this planet sits right here. So that, these are called mass radius curves. Some of you may have seen this before. But homogeneous uh, you know, mass radius uh, relations for homogeneous objects of uh, different composition, pure water, silicate, Earth-like, Fe, and so on. So if you were to look at Earth-like planets, you would sit on this Earth-like curve in mass and radius space. But if you have a planet right, right there, it's nowhere near Earth-like, right? So it's got much larger radius for its mass. So there are various scenarios you can, you can talk about, a rocky world with a thick hydrogen-rich atmosphere, a mini Neptune, which is like having a lot of ice, a little bit of a hydrogen uh, envelope, and then rocky core, and so on. Or you can have a water world, because it lies on the water curve, uh, with, a, with a lot of water. So these are a degenerate set of solutions. That, that we need to contend with if we just have the uh, radius and mass. But then for this planet, it's an interesting case study because we also have the atmospheric spectrum of this planet. So we can actually detect water vapor. We could actually detect water vapor in its atmosphere and then actually measure the amount of water in its atmosphere. Okay? So these are some uh, studies that have shown that. Uh, and then we went ahead and used atmospheric retrieval techniques, which is what we do here at Cambridge to take that spectrum and basically, sorry, these uh, plots are not uh, showing. This is the switch from Microsoft, uh, from uh, Mac to uh, Windows that got rid of my plots, but that's fine. So, <laughs> so, so imagine there are histograms here. <laughs> right? and, and those are the, those are the uh, error bars on the water abundance. Uh, so we could detect, as I showed you, in, uh, so this peak is coming from water vapor is what, what we feel. And then you can measure water vapor abundance from those plots, from, from those uh, data. And the reason uh, we want that, the water vapor abundance, is because then you can calculate the infrared opacity in the photosphere uh, of the, in, in the planet's atmosphere. So now you can use that information and the stellar radiation and some assumptions about clouds and hazes to begin to see if we can say something about the surface conditions of the planet. Okay, so we've got the hydrogen-rich atmosphere, and then if there is a water layer underneath, what sort of conditions do you expect on that water layer? So we could do this integrated study. I'll cut the long story uh, short here, but this is again showing the mass radius curves, but there are three families of solutions here uh, shown in these uh, colored curves, all of which can explain the data, but if you plot the, temp the, the loci of the temperature and pressure on the possible surface of the ocean or water layer, you see that some of those solutions fall in the liquid water regime. So 
this is a very degenerate problem, as I already mentioned, but the point is, even if a small subset of those solutions lie in the liquid water regime, that is already telling you that there is a potential. So that the, this, this is our sort of hint that you could potentially have habitable conditions, or at least liquid water, even at la on larger planets than just Earth-like planets. So, so this is a sort of a case study. And then you can also change the atmospheric parameters, different haze and cloud parameters, and you can play with the temperature structures. But there is, this is just to say that there is a space in atmospheric and bulk properties which allow for habitable conditions on the surface, even for larger planets. So if we, so, so this is a, basically one of the first demonstrations that a holistic approach by coupling the atmospheric properties that are observable and the bulk properties can allow us some constraints on the surface conditions, the interior conditions. So we went ahead, we pushed that story much further and explored the full range of in the mass radius plane that can give you those sorts of conditions, habitable conditions, and we named them Haitian planets. One of our students, uh, Savas, uh, is right here in the audience. We had fun working on this. So this stands for a hydrogen envelope and an ocean interior, uh, like uh, garden. Cool, isn't it? So, <laughs> so, 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 we, so, so you can see, this is, uh, these are the kinds of studies you want to explore when you're talking about habitability and exploring different dimensions of the parameter space. And then we get to the answer that we sought, is that what does it do to the actual habitable zone? It expands it significantly. Because hydrogen, as it turns out, is a really good greenhouse gas. So in, in, if you have just an Earth-like atmosphere, you would sort of condense out much of the greenhouse-causing compounds uh, at some point. But with hydrogen, you can go very far. So this sort of expands your volume, uh, if you will, of habitable zone planets if you, if you, if you go beyond the traditional notions. So uh, I'm, I'm um, running out of time here. So I'll just say that that was just using just one axis, right, uh, in bulk parameter space, mass radius temperature. And we already saw that you can perturb the, uh, the uh, area of habitable zone across the board. And then there are numerous other atmospheric processes that we can also study, various photochemical processes, whether you have what the surface does to the atmospheric composition and so on. You can also, for each of those solutions I showed you, the temperature profiles, you can study various internal structures, the, the space of internal structures that are possible in such planets. So this is again with one of our PhD students, Matt Nixon here. So these are the kinds of uh, studies that we need to guide our understanding or our expectation for where we ought to look for these planets, okay? Where we ought to look for habitability and biosignature when we are exploring the exoplanetary space. So in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to take that one step further. I've told you, uh, I've given you some examples of the kind of theoretical problems we want to look at. So now let's see what sort of spectroscopic observations we can make. So again, I come back to this plot, except now I'm saying that today we know uh, tens of rocky planets and the sub-Neptunes that are nearby bright stars, which means with HST already, we are able to make some detections, like I showed you the water detection. And with JWST, it's just going to revolutionize the space. So we're really at the cusp of that big revolution that's happening. Over around 400 hours of JWST time is allocated for small planets, uh, believe it or not. It's, it's a lot. So uh, what is, uh, so for transiting planets, uh, at least of these uh, uh, transiting sub-Neptunes, we'll not only have JWST, but numerous ground-based facilities, the eight to 10 meter class facilities that we have now, like VLT, and also the upcoming ELT that will start at the end of this decade. Now, this combination of facilities is going to revolutionize our understanding of planetary atmospheres in the temperate regime. Now, of course, at the end of the day, we want to find an Earth-like planet and a spectrum of it and find life, right? So that I will let Sasha to deal with. <laughs> He's going to tell you in the next talk, but I'll be a little more humble as I am. <laughs> so, so, so I'm going to talk about what's gonna happen in the next 10 years uh, with JWST. So this is uh, with hot Jupiter's giant planets, JWST is going to get these precise abundance estimates. So you can see these estimates are at about 0.1 dex precision. So extremely good, and you can do a lot of studies on plant formation and so on, and atmospheric process, and so on. 
And when you go to smaller planets, uh, uh, someone was asking what we can do with uh, small planets. For terrestrial planets that are on M doors, small stars, we can also detect several of these uh, molecules. And maybe that will be our window into understanding their geological process. And biosignatures, I'm not sure. It, it's a little tough even, even then, uh, but, but we'll see. The reason I was hesitant about making a claim about biosignatures, because it's not just about detecting a biosignature, it's about assessing whether it is a certain molecule is a biosignature, right? So there are lots of studies happening in the field <laughs> who are thinking about what is a realistic biosignature. We always think of oxygen, ozone, and things like that, but put in a different context, like an M dwarf with high, uh, a planet around an M dwarf with high radiation, oxygen may not be a biosignature. Right? So there may be abiogenic ways to get it. So, so there are studies like that which give you abiogenic false positives for various compounds. So, so we still have to wait to see what we can do, but then we can nevertheless, from our theoretical models, make predictions for various molecules and what their spectral features will be and where we should look. So I think that that is a reasonable approach. We, all, we just need to look, find the molecules, and then assess whether they can be realistic biosignatures. Now, I know people want to know, can we detect ozone on TRAPPIST-1? So yes, uh, there is a slide here. The answer is yes, but very difficult. So this is with JWST, you still need tens of transits with JWST to, to get a possible ozone detection. And a few tens of transits have been already allocated with JWST, but we'll see if we'll actually meet, meet the demands uh, of what, what is actually required to make an ozone detection. So, so the theoretically, yes, we can make an ozone detection, but we'll need a lot of investment. What we also show that if we go to slightly larger planets, like these uh, larger sub-Neptunes I was talking about, all, also in the habitable zones of their host stars, it becomes much more easier. And this is just one example. This is with modest JWST time that has already been allocated. Okay? We can already show that we can detect various molecules, including potential biosignatures, if they're present in this atmosphere. So that may be our, our chance, but we never know. It's possible that none of those plants are actually inhabited, in which case we won't detect biosignatures. But nevertheless, we would still detect all the other species like water, methane, ammonia, and so on, which would give us some constraints on their uh, surface conditions. So this is my last slide. I promised at the beginning that uh, you know, we want a, uh, I would show you a potentially integrated framework to do both the theory and the observations within the 10-year time frame, which is, uh, that is realistic. So this is all the observations that, uh, that we want and experiments that we want to make and we can make. And I'll just put uh, these uh, resources that we are about to get uh, and we already have in some cases over this decade. So those are all observational and experimental uh, observables. And then these are all the inferences and uh, interdisciplinary advances we can make to understanding this problem. So as far as the work in the center is concerned and my role in the center is concerned, uh, we want to bridge all these uh, various disciplines all the way from formation and migration conditions, which several of our colleagues here do and Mark presented um, very well, what we can expect to our colleagues in, uh, in ge geoscience and all the other aspects. So, so this is what... Uh, I think uh, is a realistic plan for us over this decade uh, that we can pursue with a combination of both theoretical advancements and observational advances, and we have all the uh, talent and the um, resources to make it. Thank you.